We're almost finished with this study we're calling Essential Truth, taking a look at the 10 big ideas in systematic theology. One topic a week for 10 weeks, we have looked at the doctrine of God and the doctrine of scripture, the doctrine of angels, demons, Satan, the doctrine of man, the doctrine of sin, the doctrine of Christ. Last week, the doctrine of salvation. This morning, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Finish up next week with the doctrine of the church, and then finally, the doctrine of the future or the end times on December 22nd. Our mission is to joyfully follow Jesus and help others to do the same. A Christian is not someone who merely believes in order to get his or her ticket to heaven and then who attends church here and there just to stay in God's good graces, if you will. A Christian is one who follows Jesus. It's someone who runs to him for forgiveness and reconciliation with God the Father. And someone who then for the rest of their life looks to him for his teaching and for his leadership. Because Jesus is not only the one who forgives our sins, but he's the one who leads our lives. And so a Christian is one who follows Jesus seeks to learn of him, learn his word, trust his promises, and obey his will. And that list of obedience could be long. Over 500 commands of Jesus in the Gospels. John Piper took those over 500 commands, he distilled them down into 50 chapters in a wonderful book called What Jesus Demands of the World. And as we've thought here at Redeemer about what it looks like to follow Jesus Christ, we've distilled it, if you will, consolidated it, if you will, into what we call our seven marks. Not seven things we do in order to earn God's love, but seven things because God loves us in Jesus Christ and because he's not only the forgiver of our sins but also the leader of our lives, what does it look like to follow him? And so we say, well, it looks like a a man or a woman who seeks God. When thou didst say, seek my face, my heart said to thee, O Lord, thy face I will seek. We say with the Apostle Paul, I want to know Christ. Secondly, we, we seek to love others. It's the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second's just like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Third, we seek to pursue holiness. We don't want to make peace with our sin. We don't want to just sweep it under the rug. But as Paul calls us to, we want to put sin to death and walk in the power of the Spirit in obedience to Christ. Fourth, serve the church. That every one of us have been given gifts and opportunities that we're meant to use in service to one another in the body of Christ Fifth, steward our resources generously. We recognize that all that we have is a stewardship from God and we're meant to look to him for how he would have us to steward those resources. Number six, share the gospel. We understand ourselves to be a sent people, that this gospel that has come to us has been entrusted to us and that plan A of God for the dissemination of the gospel into the world is through the lives of his people. And then finally, multiply disciples. We wanna help others follow Jesus so that they can help others follow Jesus so that they can help others follow Jesus. When we think about these things, maybe 
maybe we could call it a robust description of discipleship, learning from and following after Jesus. If you're anything like me, you want to scream, help, help. Seek God, love others, pursue holiness, serve the church, steward your resources, share the gospel, multiply disciples. Yes, 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 but help. In John chapter 14, if you have your Bible, please turn with me there. In fact, turn to John chapter 13. We'll begin briefly in chapter 13 and then zero in on a couple verses in chapter 14. Chapter 13 is the famous chapter in the Bible of Jesus washing his disciples' feet and calling them to do likewise, to live a life of service towards others. But the chapter begins this way, chapter 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father. Jesus knew that the hour was coming when he would be betrayed into the hands of sinners, they would take him, brutally scourge him, torture him, crucify him, he would die, give his life upon the cross, but he also knew that he would be raised from the dead and then soon after, be exalted back into his heavenly father's presence. He knew that his hour would come, that he would depart out of this world to the father. He knew that that was coming. So if you look a little bit later in verse 31, therefore, when he had gone out, Jesus said, now is the son of man glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him immediately. Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And I said, as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. So again, Jesus is anticipating he's about to leave to die, to rise, and then to return back to the glory which he had with his father before all time. Part of his message now in chapter 14, verse one, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So Jesus says, I'm going away, back to my father's house. Don't let your heart be troubled though, I'm preparing a place for you. I will come again and receive you to myself. And, And so there's this going away of Jesus, but a future coming back to receive his people to himself. And between that, between his ascension, exaltation to his father's right hand and his coming again to receive us to himself, in chapter 13 and 14 and 15 and 16, we are called upon to wash one another's feet, to serve one another, to love one another. We see that in 1334, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another, even as I've loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Here in chapter 14, we will be called upon to keep Christ's commandments. In chapter 15, to abide in Christ so that we will bear much fruit. In chapter 16, to endure persecution. Chapter 17 in his high priestly prayer, the implication that we have been sent out into the world with the gospel, 
Just as God the Father had sent Jesus, now Jesus sends us. So between his ascension, exaltation, and his coming again to receive us to himself, you and I are called upon to live a life of love, a life of obedience, a life of abiding in Christ and bearing much fruit, a life of service to others, a life sent out into the world with the gospel message. Help! Verse 15 of chapter 14. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. That he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Praise God that with this call of Jesus Christ to obey him, to follow him, comes the provision of the Holy Spirit of God to help us. The great Bible teacher Warren Wearsby, speaking of that word helper or comforter, it's the Greek word parakletos, and all of the commentators agree it's hard to bring it down into one word, comforter, encourager, in, in 1 John, the same word is translated advocate. He writes, the Greek word translated comforter or helper is parakletos. It's only used by John. We see it in chapter 14, in chapter 15, in chapter 16, and then again in 1 John 2. It means called alongside to assist. The Holy Spirit does not work instead of us or in spite of us, but in us and through us. He goes on, our English word comfort comes from two Latin words meaning with strength. We usually think of comfort as soothing someone, consoling him or her, and to some extent that is true. But true comfort strengthens us to face life bravely and keep on going. It does not rob us of responsibility or make it easy for us to give up. Some translations call the Holy Spirit the encourager, and this is a good choice of words. Pericletos is translated advocate in 1 John 2. An advocate is one who represents you at court and stands by your side to to plead your case. New American standard is helper. I like that one. I like them all. Comforter, encourager, advocate, helper. Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send another helper. And he says the duration of his stay is forever. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. You and I as children of God will never be in want of a helper, a comforter, an encourager. You and I will never have to grieve the departure of the Spirit as, quite honestly, maybe the disciples were somewhat grieving the departure of Jesus. He's saying he's going to leave. He's going back to his Father in heaven. And maybe that was a scary thing for them. He had been leading them, Jesus had, advising them, teaching them, empowering them, even critiquing them helping them grow and helping them in their times of need. 
But again, his time with them was limited and his followers would need a new companion whose presence with them would not be limited and who would, if you will, function in the same way that Jesus had when on the earth with his disciples. Keep my commandments. I'm gonna send a helper, an encourager, a comforter, someone to give you strength, someone to lead the way for you. And briefly, he's called the spirit of truth here. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you, that is, the spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And our God is a God of truth. He is the standard of truth, he is the source of all truth. He cannot lie, he does not associate himself with lies, and thus the Spirit of God, who is the Spirit of truth, never leads you or me to do anything contrary to the word of God, nothing ever against the will of God. We'll talk about some more things that he does for us as it regards God's truth. But one last thing maybe from this passage. He will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and their plan before all ages to save a people to the glory of his grace. That plan included necessarily that the eternal Son of God would become incarnate. The second person of the Trinity would take a human nature to himself. Again, we celebrate at Christmas. The eternal Word of God who became flesh and dwelt among us. The Son of God was God with us as one of us as he became a man, the Son of God becoming incarnate. With the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, this is God with us, not as one of us, but as in us and among us. While the eternal Son became incarnate, taking to himself a human nature, becoming flesh. The Spirit of God did not become incarnate but came to indwell all of the followers of the incarnate Son. And so his residence, if you will, for all of those who follow Jesus is that he dwells within us. This is the very presence of God. As we sang, your holy presence living in me. It's God coming to dwell in us. Of course, the Holy Spirit was active in Old Testament times. He's there from the very beginning. In Genesis chapter one, hovering over the surface of the deep and throughout Old Testament times, the Spirit of God would come upon people to empower them for particular missions that God had for them. But at the same time, apparently in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God could come upon someone and then leave them. We read of God's spirit departing from King Saul. And many of us are familiar with David when confessing his sin in Psalm 51. He praying to 
to God said, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. But Jesus, God, were doing something new. Jesus, having come and lived and died and risen and been exalted to his Father's right hand, promising that he would send another helper, did just that. And Acts chapter 2 sent the Holy Spirit of God to fill and indwell all of the lives of his people. So, we might not be out of bounds to call this entire age that we are in the age of the Spirit, indwelling the lives of his people for his glory and for our good. So that's just a little bit. Let's share a little bit more. I want to give you a picture of a handful of things that the Spirit of God does for us as the children of God. Things that he did before you and I came to Christ and things that he does now in our lives. And again, you have to be so selective when you only have about 10 more minutes to do this. But number one, before you and I came to faith in Jesus Christ, it was the Holy Spirit of God who convicted you of sin and righteousness and judgment. If you were here with us last week, it was a powerful sermon, at least I hope you thought it was, at least the ideas were, let's say it like that, of God's foreknowledge of his people, his predestining of his people, and then his calling of his people, that in time the Spirit of God came to work in your life and in mine to convict us. Jesus said the Spirit would be in the world to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Along the way, you and I came to feel the weight of our sin in ways that maybe we'd never felt it before. We came to realize that we were sinners before God. He convicted us of righteousness, that we don't have it that compared to the holy righteousness of God, we are unrighteous. And he convicted us of judgment. We came to realize that we were sinners, that we lacked the righteousness which which God requires us to have, and that because of it, judgment was coming. And through that kind of conviction and that calling work, he began to open our eyes or he opened our eyes to the glory of God, to the sinfulness of ourselves and to the beauty of Jesus. We came to realize that Jesus was God's provision for our sin. That it was our sin that separated us from God but that God had sent Jesus Christ to live for us, to die for us, to rise for us and we began to see that as true and as wonderful and as for us. And we believed. Friends, if you trust in Jesus Christ, you are a beneficiary of the Holy Spirit's mysterious, invisible, yet awesome and very real work of wooing you to faith in Jesus. Maybe you heard the gospel dozens of times, maybe hundreds of times from your parents, from that preacher, from that Sunday school teacher, all your life growing up, and it went in one ear and out the other. And maybe there was a period of time in your life where not only did it go in one ear and out the other, but you heard it and went, But then somewhere along the way, you heard it again. And it became to you glorious. Why? The Spirit of God convicting you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Spirit of God 
We talked about this one last week, regenerating you. Regenerate means to give life to. You and I were dead in our sins. And God the Holy Spirit gave us life. Listen to this in Titus 3. I love this passage because it's, it's addressing you and me as Christians in relationship to unbelievers or not yet Christians. And it's encouraging you and me not to get cocky towards them, arrogant towards them. And here's what it says. When the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. You and I are to be humble because we were not saved because we were better than anybody else. We were saved because of God's mercy. Not on the basis of deeds which we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Spirit of God convicted us, called us, regenerated us, renewed us, and we put our faith in Jesus. And then he did a number of things for us. He came to indwell us. He baptized us into the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For by one spirit, you were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. This is why, friends, no matter how old you are, how young you are, no matter where you come from, no matter the color of your skin, no matter the education you got or did not get, no matter how rich you are, how poor you are, it matters not. In Jesus Christ, we are all one. He is our head. We have been baptized into his body, and now we are members one of another. Amen? Amen. This is a work of the Spirit that he makes us part of this body, all of us different members with Christ as our head, and thus we appreciate one another and we honor one another and we love one another and we serve one another. He gifts every one of God's children. A spiritual gift is that special ability to love others in a way that when God pushes your love button is just what comes out, if you will. There are, the, Paul said, 1 Corinthians, there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit, a variety of ministries and the same Lord, a variety of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. For the one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit, another the word of knowledge according to the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one spirit, to another the effecting of miracles, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing of spirits, of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. The Spirit of God convicts us, he calls us, he grants to us life. We believe in Jesus and he baptizes us into the body of Christ and he gives us a spiritual gift with which we are to serve the body of Christ. He also seals us in Ephesians chapter one. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. God put his mark upon you and me, his seal. You belong to me. That seal is the Holy Spirit which he has given to all of his children. And it's just like you fellows when you gave that ring to her 
Or ladies, when you gave that ring to him, you made a pledge. Baby, you think this ring is awesome? You get me for the next 40 years. (laughs) Right? But that's what it's play. It's the first of everything else that's to come. The pledge we're sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view of the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. And after you and I have come to Christ, the Holy Spirit of God continually works in us. He illumines us to the word of God. I don't know if you've ever been there, but sometimes I read the word of God and I feel like, boy, I'm just not getting much out of it. I try not to let that deter me, though, from staying here and seeking the Lord through his word. But then there are some times as well where it's just like something pops off the page. I think that's the illuminating Work of God's spirit. It's like the psalmist who prayed, open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. God, I'm gonna read your word and my eyeballs are gonna do it and my brain's gonna do what it does but I'm asking you to to do something more. Open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law in Psalm 119.73. Give me understanding to learn your commandments. When we pray, when the psalmist prays like that, when you and I pray like that, I believe we're praying for the work of the Holy Spirit to be at work in us as we're communing with God through the scriptures. The Holy Spirit helps us with prayer. Romans 8 In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. I think all of us have been there in hardship, in suffering, and we just don't know what to pray. Fear not. God's word says when you and I don't know what to pray, the spirit of God is there to help us. Interceding for us with groanings too deep for words. The spirit of God also empowers you and me for holiness. In Romans 8, so then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God. John Owen wrote a whole book, not a very long book, but it's a weighty book called The Mortification of Sin. The the mortification, the putting to death of sin. It was an entire book on that verse. But if by the Spirit we put to death the deeds of the body, we will live. And he made clear at least two things. Number one, it is your responsibility and mine to put sin to death. The pursuit of holiness is not a let go and let God. Paul said if by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body. And so it's a, it's a call to active faith, trust, and obedience, this fight of faith for holiness. But secondly, as it is our responsibility to put our sin to death, secondly, the Holy Spirit of God is there to be the power by which we do it. If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body. If you've been around here, you've you've heard me talk about aptat before. A-P-T-A-T. What does it look like practically to walk in the spirit that we don't carry out the desires of the flesh or 
What does it look like practically when facing a temptation to avoid or a, a duty, if you will, to obey? How do, you, how do you do that? And I learned this from John Piper years ago. It's been so helpful. A, you admit that you cannot do it without Christ's power. John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. Lord, this temptation is too much for me. Lord, what you're calling me to do is, I don't think I can do it. I admit that I can't do it without Christ. P, pray, pray, God, would you help me? Would you help me to resist this temptation? Would you help me to to do what you're asking me to do? Would you help me to love my wife as Christ loved the church? Would you help me to keep my mouth shut when everybody else around me is gossiping and I'm so tempted to jump right in? Would you help me to resist this? Would you help me to pursue that? I admit I can't do it without you. I'm praying that you would help me. T, trust a particular promise from God. And this is when our scripture memory can become so helpful to us. We wanna trust God's word. A, act. If you put to death the deeds of the body, you, Mitch, you've got to do it. You've got to trust God and obey God. But, but you've admitted you can't do it in your own strength. You're praying that he would help you do it. You're trusting in his, the promises of his word. And then you go obey. And then T, When it's all said and done, you thank him that he gave you the desire to obey and the power to obey. That's pretty good. It's the spirit of God that comes alongside us, a helper for us as we try to put to death our pride or our anger or our lust or our greed or our envy or whatever it might be. To put to death the deeds of the body and to walk in love. We don't have time, but I'm going to take it. All right. Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit, I've heard me quote it a thousand times, is love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and faithfulness and gentleness, self-control. It doesn't happen often, but every once in a while I'll be asked by a newcomer, Hey, are y'all a spirit-filled church? You spirit-filled church? Now, I know what they're asking. And so I said, well, it depends on what you're asking. I think what you're asking is, are we a church that believes that the Holy Spirit of God gives gifts to his people and part of those gifts are miraculous gifts like tongues and the like and do we actively pursue gifts like that the gifts of tongues and healing and the like and if on any given Sunday morning you were going to see those kinds of gifts being manifest in our church if that's what you mean by is Redeemer a spirit filled church we're probably not the church for you. If though what you mean by spirit-filled church is that we're a church of love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, which I know is not what they're asking, I say if that's what you mean, then I'd love to believe that we're a spirit-filled church. And my point in that is that a spirit-filled person doesn't necessarily, that doesn't necessarily come out in miraculous gifts like tongues and healings and the like. A spirit-filled person is a person of love, a person of joy in the midst of heartache, a person of peace, a person of goodness and the like. When you and I walk by the Spirit, it's those kinds of things that come out of us. Finally, the Spirit of God empowers us for mission. 
You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. When Jesus said in Matthew 28, after he was raised from the dead, before he ascended into heaven, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I really believe when he said, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, it's my spirit will indwell you and abide with you and empower you and comfort you and help you every step of the way. It's time to go, but I hope you and I will do this, that we will rejoice. That God the Father sent his son to live, to die, to rise for us. And that by trusting in him, we can have the forgiveness of sins and be reconciled to him and be adopted into his family and all the like. And God the Father has sent the Holy Spirit of God to indwell us, to help us, to gift us, to encourage us, to illumine us, to strengthen us, to empower us every single day as we trust and obey. What a gift. God the Father, who planned our salvation in ages past. God the Son, who came and accomplished it in his life, death, and resurrection. The Spirit of God, who applies it to our life and then fills us and empower us, empowers us for a life of holiness and mission until Christ comes again to receive us to himself. Let's pray. We'll sing and be done this morning. Father, thank you for Christ, our Lord, and thank you for the mighty Holy Spirit of God. Thank you for your very presence with us and in us. Help us, Lord, to learn and to live what it means to walk by the Spirit that we might not carry out the desires of the flesh. To be led by the Spirit, thus putting to death the deeds of our body and walking in love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Teach us what it means to be empowered by the Spirit for mission. That we will be empowered when the Spirit comes upon us and we will be your witnesses. Teach us what that means. We bless you. We thank you. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.